Oh boy, I can already hear the gods of mathematics scream in agony. Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to another video. So I received this differential boy this morning and it looked nice and clickbaity. So I thought I might as well present it to you guys. And actually I came up with three different ways of solving this right here. It might not seem obvious at first how to solve something like this. So differentiating a function with respect to another function, but it's quite easy to be honest, at least in this example, I guess it can get arbitrarily difficult. Um, regarding some examples. So at first I would like to introduce the chain rule to you guys. You know it, you, you definitely know it, but maybe you don't know the Leibniz notation for the chain rule. So suppose we have the f of x differentiated with respect to some function g of x. The Leibniz notation for the chain rule just said that we are differentiating this function f of x with respect to x at first, and then we are multiplying it by the differential of x with respect to co um, g of x in this case. <laughs> okay, so that's nice. And you might as well notice that those are fractions. So we can rewrite this as d f of x differentiated with respect to x divided by d g of x differentiated with respect to x. And we can also rewrite this as d f of x over dx and then over d g of x over dx. That might look kind of ugly. It does look really ugly because those are differentials, but it works. It does work out. So we can apply this method here. So let's just use this right here and see what we get. So we end up with, um, let's put it here. So now we have d sine of x differentiated with respect to x over d cosine of x differentiated with respect to x. And that's really easy to solve. We know how to evaluate that. So differentiating sine leaves us with the cosine of x and differentiating cosine leaves us with minus sine of x. And all in all, this is just the negative cotangent with respect to x. And that was the first way. So the second way I came up with is by using the unit circle. And that might be the more appropriate way, the more exact way of solving something like this. So at first I would like to take a look at the unit circle. Cosine and sine are defined on the unit circle. So that's supposed to be a circle. Yeah, it's kind of okay. And let's say we have a radius right here. That's going to be the hypotenuse. And we have some line right here. So we are going to identify a right triangle here. That's the right triangle. and. That's the unit circle, so that means the, the radius, the hypotenuse, is just one. And we also have, um, oh, we have used an x coordinate here, so let's say this right here is y and this is z. It doesn't quite matter. So, okay, that, that means we are have a, a having a line representing the y coordinate and we are having a line right here, it's representing a z coordinate. Okay, nice. And we are working with a right triangle, so that means we can identify some stuff. For example, what is the sign? So the sign? of x and the angle x is right here. <laughs> Sine of x is nothing but, okay, now we have y over 1, so at, uh, opposite over hypotenuse, which is just y. And now for the cosine, cosine of x is nothing but, well, that's adjacent over hypotenuse, z over 1, so this leaves us with z. So the first step is that we can say we now have d sine of x differentiated with respect to, and well, our cosine is this set right here. So that's the first step. And now we want to express this sign right here with respect to set. And that's quite easy to be honest, because we have our Papa Pythagoras, which tells us that one squared, which is nothing but one, is equal to um, z squared plus y squared. So now we want to solve for y in this case. So that also means with y being strictly greater than zero. It's a right triangle. That's something that's given. y is nothing but the positive square root of one minus z squared. And we can plug this information in. So we end up with d, dz of the square root one minus z squared. I hope you guys could follow everything. It's quite easy. And well, what's the square root of something? That's nothing but d, dz one minus z squared 
two to one half power. And differentiating that is really easy with respect to set. We now end up with one half, dragging this exponent down and reducing it by one. So times one minus z squared to the minus one half power. Okay, and then we have to use the J rule once again. So differentiating the inside leaves us with minus two times z. The two and the one half is going to cancel out, it's going to become a one. And well, one minus z squared to the minus one half power is nothing but one over square root one minus z squared. And also we can bring this minus z in the numerator. That's supposed to be a two. And then we are basically done. And you might notice something. Well, we identified z as being the cosine of x, so minus cosine of x over and square root 1 minus z squared is nothing but y, but y is just our sine of x. So this is sine of x and we end up with negative cotangent of x. And that was the second way. Now for the third way. We are going to use the limit definition of the derivative. And it's quite easy. We just need to plug this in. So I brought it into this form we have derived earlier. So that means the derivative of f of x with respect to x is nothing but the limit as some delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Okay, nice. That's the first part over the limit as delta x approaches zero. And that's the limit definition for this g of x. So g of x plus delta x minus g of x over delta x. The good thing is we can use the rules for limits to just um, bring this limit to the outside so we can factor it out, I would say, and also we can cancel those out. So what we end up with at first is just the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over g of x plus delta x minus g of x. So that's the third way that came to my mind. And now we can plug this information in because our f of x is nothing but sine and our g of x is nothing but cosine. So we can plug this information in. So that means that we now have the limit as delta x goes to zero of, and now we have the sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x over cosine of x plus delta x minus the cosine of x. Whew, that's a lot of writing and it's really hot in here. Just like I said before in different videos, in various videos. Okay, now we can use addition formulae to rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to derive them in some other videos. Now just take them for granted. Now we have the limit as delta x goes to zero of the sine of this right here. It's nothing but sine of x cosine of delta x plus cosine of x sine of delta x minus sine of x. That's the first part. Over. <laughs> and now we have this term right here. This is going to evaluate to cosine of x times cosine of delta x minus sine of x sine of delta x minus the cosine of x. That's a really long expression. So why not factor out in the numerator the sine of x, for example, we have it here and here, and in the, nu uh, in, in the numerator this, and in the denominator we are going to cancel out cosine of x. This way I mix numerator and denominator up. Uh, English is a very hard language. So we now have the limit as delta x goes to zero of, and now we have sine of x times, now we have cosine of delta x, minus 1 in this case, plus cosine of x sine of delta x over. And now we have the cosine of x times. Now we have the cosine of delta x minus 1 minus the sine of x sine of delta x. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. So I factored that out. And oh boy, I can already hear the gods of mathematics scream in agony. <laughs> what the fuck was that? I can feel the anger. To be honest, I couldn't come up in this short amount of time with a real solution to this limit. I tried around a little bit and what I tried was small angle approximation for sine and cosine. Please don't hate me, I'm an engineer. <laughs> so. 
the bad thing is it it actually works and that's something that makes me really angry never mind <laughs> so small angle approximation just says if we have really small values for delta x in that case and delta x is going to zero that means our cosine of delta x is going to be one approximately and our sine of delta x is approximately going to be delta x in that case but just for really really small values of delta x and where well, delta x is going to zero so it's really really small at some point so what we can conclude if we apply the limit and i'm just going to place a squiggly boy right here it's an approximation we are going to end up with sine of x times this is going to evaluate to one minus one and you might notice this is going to be zero and then positive sine of delta x is going to evaluate to delta x cosine of x and then over this is going to evaluate to cosine of x times one minus one once again this right here it's just going to be zero minus delta x because we have sine of delta x and then sine of x and you might notice this and that is going to cancel out and this approximation actually fits the real result of minus cosine of x over sine of x which is just minus the cotangent of x i'm terribly sorry if you come up with a real way of solving this limit right here then feel free to solve uh, to send me um, some kind of papers something you have handwritten just something a picture via my email which should be up here or something you you know what my email is it's this weird little thing with the weird name <laughs> never mind i hope you did enjoy this quick little video if you did please like and subscribe and recommend me if you like and don't forget to activate this little notification bell so that you can receive all notifications regarding my channel if you want to support me a bit more link to my patreon is in the description i would appreciate all kinds of help from you guys even if it's just a buck every month <laughs> and up until the next video have flamble day see ya Oh boy, I can already hear the gods of mathematics scream in agony. <laughs>